I am. I think it's great the question. It's been a number of years. Right. Of New York, the former mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani. He's joining us. His son Andrew has been a guest with us for the last, ooh, over the last month or so. He's been with us quite a few times. So welcome both of you to the program. Let me begin with you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to have you back. Thank you for joining us. How are things going? It's a great pleasure to be back with you. Things are going very well. We're, we're, uh, I'm enjoying campaigning again. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss not being mayor? Particularly for such a great candidate. Do I miss being mayor? I didn't for a long time. I didn't for a long time because despite, you know, a certain degree of political difference with Mayor Bloomberg, I thought he was a good mayor in that he kept the city safe. And both he and Ray Kelly kept up what I was doing and approved of it. Uh, since de Blasio, I have increasingly become very worried about the city. And now I'm very depressed and sad about it because I think they have destroyed much of what I did and uh, what, what uh, Mike Bloomberg did. They've made it again, a city that people are afraid of. They've made it a city that's impossibly expensive to live in. They have a budget that's larger than the state of Florida. And the corruption in the city is much greater than people realize. It's almost from top to bottom. But you think it's better now under Eric Adams than under Bill de Blasio? Actually, it has more crime under Eric Adams, which is a big surprise. It's somewhat covered up by the newspapers who seem to, I guess they want him to succeed. But it's astounding to me that crime is up 40% since he became mayor. Also, he doesn't seem to know what he's doing. He has no plan. He's still working on his plan. And the subways are probably worse than I ever remember. And he doesn't seem to have the slightest clue how to reduce the crime in the subways, which any one of my three police commissioners, Kelly or I, could probably do in two weeks. So uh, we have that's the biggest issue and that may drive also, I think, the governor's race. We'll get to that in just a moment or so. Um, I, are you being, what's happening with the FBI, all the investigations? What do you make of what's happening in Capitol Hill with the January 6th uh, hearings? Well, I, I see that as just a continuation of Russian collusion. Uh, the same people who did Russian collusion, the same liars and cheats and people who lied for five years and were encouraged by the media to do it are the people running this committee. I mean, I don't know if you, I don't know if it's possible to be a bigger liar than Schiff. He, he claimed for four years that he had evidence of Russian collusion. Sort of reminds you of, if people can remember Joe McCarthy on steroids. Now he's doing the same thing with January 6th. And at least uh, two thirds of the members of those committees, all Democrats, except for the two Republican renegades, Every single one of them were, let's call them uh, Russian collusion liars. They knew it was untrue. They were told by Brennan and by uh, Clapper it was untrue. And they continued to try to frame the president in order to remove him from office. That's a despicable crime. And how people can actually even look at them and take them seriously is very, very hard to understand. And some of them should be in jail for trying to frame a president of the United States for a crime he didn't commit. Have you spoken to the president, President Donald Trump, recently? Uh, two days ago. And what's he saying about what all that's going on on Capitol Hill? Well, he, no, he, he's used to it. He's used to being accused. I mean, look, it's the same group, it's the same group of liars. They can't even find a new group of liars to do it. So this has been going on for five years. First, Russian collusion turns out to be a lie. Then the conversation with the president of the Ukraine turns out to be perfectly appropriate if they hadn't covered up the hard drive. Uh, that includes, by the way, Bill Barr, who covered up the hard drive. It completely exonerates the president. 
and deprive the American people of evidence of at least 60 crimes committed by Joe Biden and Hunter Biden, uh, in which they took well over $31 million from China, 50% of which went to Joe Biden. All of that is in the hard drive that was censored for 16 months, which the New York Times and Washington Post have finally admitted that President Trump and I were telling the truth and all the people on the January 6th committee were lying. That should give the American people a pretty good indication of who's telling the truth and who's lying right now. You think they're going to put you on trial anytime in the near future? Where is that the holding? Uh, I have no idea what they're going to do. They're completely unscrupulous, but I'm ready for anything they can do. I have a substantial amount of proof for everything I've said. Everything I've said comes from the American people. I have over 350 affidavits of uh, voter fraud committed in Pennsylvania, just in Pennsylvania. And of course, the recent movie, 2000 Mules, if anybody would care to look at it, completely vindicates both the president and me by using technology that is widely used by the FBI and CIA to prove that thousands and thousands of phony folks were stuffed into boxes at three and four in the morning. It's both tracked electronically and it's also videotaped. Well, we, we live a certainly an interesting time. I'm going to get to a moment to, to your son running. <laughs> um, listen, there's a lot going on. And, and I'll tell you, what, I, I know you're not a fan of the American Civil Liberties Union, and I'm not such a big fan either. But when they represented everybody, whether they liked their opinions or not, you know, I had a certain amount of respect today. The no, only I, I, I did, too. You know, I have to tell you, Zev, uh, I, I had a certain I had, did, I had a certain dis- degree of respect for American liberals for the fact that they would they they would say I'll defend an opinion I disagree with and the real sign of your commitment to to the first amendment is if you defend the people who disagree with you and their right to speak now instead they try and to try to ruin the people they disagree with and they try to put them in jail and bankrupt Exactly. In other words, I when they only like defend the people they like, it's they lost a lot of respect. If they represent people they didn't like, that to me was something. And but that's we lost that whole conversation in this country. We're so partisan, and we can't talk to people we don't like their viewpoints, and that's what's wrong, unfortunately, with the country today. Uh, yeah, but, you're that, exactly right. Exactly right. Now, I understand that Rabbi Milton Balkan, he does a program for us on our network. I understand he enthusiastically endorsed you. And Mary Julian, you probably may remember, he was a key player in both of your elections. In fact, after you won both times, the day after the election, you thanked the entire of Brooklyn by going to Rabbi Balkany's school. I believe you had uh, remembered him recently, too, from what I understand. Well, Andrew and I had breakfast with him just the other day. I mean, I, I, I'm a great admirer and he was also quite a wise advisor to me, not just on political matters, but on matters of morality and decency. And he's a really exceptional, exceptionally wise man. And if you're his friend, you're very lucky. Uh, thank you. Um, listen, he does a wonderful work, and uh, we always enjoy having him on the air because he has his finger on the pulse. And I know that he met with you and Andrew, so that's uh, certainly interesting and important because this is a very in- this is a very important race for New York. Now, the Yiddish expression you probably know, Rudy, called nachas, that when you have oh, yes. joy from your son, <laughs> right? So uh, I- I'll tell you a quick quick story. When I interviewed Al Gore's father, Senator Gore Sr., so he speaks with this southern accent. And, and a guy from Borough Park calls him with a Hungarian accent. He goes, Senator Gord, I want to thank you for what you do. You should have a lot of nachas from your sons. He goes, thank you, young man. And then during the commercial break, he hits me, goes, what's this nachas, boy? <laughs> <laughs> True story. But you're shopping nachas because Andrew is following you. I remember everybody said when I announced you're going to be on this. Oh, I remember Andrew he was a young kid running around when you were mayor. Yeah, you remember and then, that? And now he's grown up and he's running for oh, governor. Oh, he sure he has. Wants- he's quite a man. He really is. 
He certainly is, and you must be Shevon Nachas. So you're back in the campaign. Here. What are you hearing out there? Because I know it's a four-way race, and some of it is a little nasty as well on the campaign trail. Well, you know, I, uh, Andrew has, to his credit, stayed very much out of the nastiness of it. Uh, and I have to say, in defense of the other two candidates, all the attacking has happened by Zelda. I mean, he began, he began attacking them calling uh calling rob astorino rolex rob accusing wilson of being a criminal and uh, the reality is none of that's true and i think they just defended themselves but when they did and particularly when andrew caught zeldin in a major lie i think zeldin has melted down there's an article in the yonkers papers today that his campaign is in free fall. I mean, he got caught in a lie by Andrew. Andrew asked him, did you ever refer to uh, Trump's remarks as racist? He basically said no. And then you can put on a tape in which he said that Trump's remarks were racist on CNN twice. That's what you call lying. And, uh, He's been doing that, not just about that, but he's been doing that about the other candidates quite a bit. So Andrew, to his credit, has stayed above that. He's, uh, except for that one question, which was a question, not an accusation. He's made no accusations against anyone. And he stuck to his eight point plan to reduce crime. He's the only one that's going to put up a fund of $5 billion to restore the police. The rest don't seem to think that's necessary. He's the only one that seems that understands how to use the Comstat system to bring down crime. How we have to deal with career criminals and going back to three strikes and you're out. And he was the very first one to say almost the day that Bragg wrote the letter that he would remove Alvin Bragg immediately under an article of the Constitution that the other ones didn't even seem to know about. Now, let me bring Andrew in, because Andrew is joining us in this conversation as well. So, Andrew, let me ask you this question. Do you feel left out because some of the attack ads attack uh, Rob Astrino, they attack Lou Zeldin, they attack uh, uh, Harry Wilson, but do, it seems like you're left out some of the attack. Do you feel left out that they don't mention you when they attack each other? I feel like the adult in the room, actually, Zeb, to be perfectly honest. Look, my, my entire focus this campaign is focusing on solutions for New York, which is many reasons why we lead the country in out migration. And we need to figure out what we're going to do from a crime perspective, from an economic perspective, how we're going to ultimately get rid of these unconstitutional health mandates to not allow me in two of the three debates. Um, so to me, this is, I think, so much more important than whatever personal issues there were. Um, I thought it was important to show uh, that Lee Zeldin, unfortunately, uh, flip-flopped and lied to New Yorkers. But aside from that, I've wanted to focus, focus completely on the issues. And I think I've done a successful job at doing that. And, uh, of course, crime is the major issue in the race. So, Rudy, when you're campaigning together with Andrew, is that what people want to know when some of your policies are going to be reinstated on the state level? Is that what you're hearing out there? Yeah, there's no question that crime is the major issue. The polls indicate that it's like 80 percent of the people consider crime a major issue. But there are other issues. I mean, the economy of the state is terrible. We spend uh, $200 billion in this state. They only spend $98 billion in Florida, and they have a million, a million more people. So something's wrong, and some of that money is going in the wrong hands. We've got a major corruption problem in Albany. We've lost uh, two governors who had to resign in scandal, the controller who went to jail. And now we have a new governor who lost her lieutenant governor within about two days. And she's working on a deal for the Buffalo Stadium, which I have to tell you as an ex-prosecutor, stinks to high heaven. Not because they're building the stadium, but because the husband is going to get the concessions to the stadium and the crooked press won't report it. 
So what happened to the media? What happened to the media, Rudy? What happened to the media? It went uh, it went completely in the tank for the Democrat Party. So we're going to get I mean, at least with regard to the two prior governors, it took a few years before they had a resigning scandal. Our lieutenant governor had to resign in two weeks. And her husband, understand this, her husband owns the company or is one of the owners of the company that does the concessions for the Buffalo Bills. When you do new concessions in a new stadium, the value goes up two or three times as it did in Yankee Stadium. Her husband stands to make a fortune from her decision to spend $4 billion to build that stadium. And she's spending $4 billion because it's going to cost $1.2 billion to build it. And she had to pay off the other Democratic representatives who wanted things for their district in return for voting for her stadium. So let me ask so you this question, man. Four well, billion dollars. Yeah. And that's that's just a microcosm of why we spend almost two and a half times Florida because we have a lot more corruption than Florida. So let me ask this question, Andrew. If you get to be governor, will you stop the construction of the uh, stadium in uh, in Buffalo? I won't stop the construction, but I'll make sure that my family is not profiting off of a deal that the state is doing. I mean, look, you can just take out Bill Hochul and put in Hunter Biden. And I think people will understand what's going on. Uh, to me, th that's a major problem over here, right? I mean, so I, I think this, but to be honest, we should see exactly what this is, which is just payout for Hochul's family and all this. And you can see it no further than Bill Hochul. Why did he not recuse himself from all this? It's corruption 101 years, Ev. We're speaking with Rudy Giuliani. His son is Andrew Giuliani running for governor of New York. We'll continue our conversation right after these messages. He, FMHC2. Our guest, just for a few minutes longer, is Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York. His son, Andrew Giuliani, is running for governor. The primary date is this coming Tuesday, and I urge everybody, you must go vote. We have to exercise our patriotic duty. You must go out and vote. Okay, talk line network, and uh, we're going to squeeze in a couple of emails. Here's an email question for you, gentlemen. Uh, will Andrew rehire teachers that were fired by the NYC Education Department after the Jewish religious exemption request to be, not be vaccinated with the experimental COVID vaccines were denied? Thank you, and on your campaign. Yes, 100%. On day one, that's something that doesn't have to go through the legislature. That'll come right out of the executive branch. And I will hire any teacher, firefighter, nurse, uh, any civil servant who lost their job with back pay. Um, I, I find it to be absurd. And obviously, look, I know what it's like. I, I'm actually the only candidate that chose not to get the shot. All the other ones are talking to talk. I'm actually walking the walk on this. And it's, uh, it's absurd that when we have a CDC director, Zev, who's actually said that this does not prevent transmission, the vaccine does not prevent transmission, then what are we doing now? It's just political theater. That's what it is at this point. Well, now, have you gotten any flag for not taking the vaccine on the campaign trail? Well, they won't let me in the first two debates. I had to do remotely, uh, both for the CBS and the New York One debates. Uh, Newsmax, they finally let me in. And you know what? It sounds like we won all three of them. So <laughs> Maybe it worked out, but, uh, but yeah, look, I mean, I've stood at so many of these health rallies, medical freedom rallies with New Yorkers that have lost their job because they've chosen not to get it. That should be everybody's individual choice. That mandate coming down from the governor. Okay. Let's squeeze in one or two phone calls. Let's go to Stan and Forest Hills. Go ahead, Stan and Forest Hills. Your question for our guests. Andrew, how are you, sir? Stan, how are you? there yeah, he's there go ahead and stand okay andrew I, i'd like to know you you have no history in anything in terms of why don't you run for like state senator or councilman or something to begin with and then down the road run for governor so you want what have you done well, to, you to run for governor i'll let andrew well, respond to you wants to know your credentials stan i work four oh, years oh, in the white house why isn't he running for something else president trump or 
Go ahead. Dan, are you going to let me answer the question? Or do you, do you want to make a statement? Go ahead. I'll, I'll let you re let you respond because you, he, the question was about your credentials. Sure. So give you an opportunity to respond to that. Okay. Yes, Dan. So I worked four years in the White House for President Trump. And under those four years, I had the opportunity to work on many top issues like his regulatory agenda. When he said for every regulation he'd sign into law, he would cut two. That number was over eight to one by the time he walked out of the White House. That's why we saw record unemployment. I also worked on the Paycheck Protection Program when the world was shutting down the CARES Act, which got $8 billion to our MTA for funding, uh, the 9-11 Health Fund. And then the I was actually on the opioid task force for President Trump. So working at the pinnacle of government in the White House, directly with President Trump as his special assistant, it's a higher level than any of the other candidates have experienced in government. Um, so I understand uh, that's your opinion on it. But what I would say is you can ask President Trump about my leadership skills. I think he'll he'll speak very highly. So let me ask you this question. Uh, here's an email coming in. I greatly this is what Sarah writes. I greatly miss the Giuliani years when I can take the trains with confidence and trust. I haven't used the trains for more than two years. I'd love to have a Giuliani governor, but I'm quite despondent at getting one into office in this liberal progressive state. Well, I mean, I, go okay. ahead, Rudy. Go ahead, Rudy. Go ahead. Uh, th th there's no reason why Andrew can't be elected. Uh, right now, 82% of the of the New York people believe that crime is the number one issue, and it is. And there is no one who has better credentials than Andrew Giuliani on reducing crime. And it isn't just because of me. It's because he studied it. He's been involved in it. He understands it. He spent a year and a half preparing to run. None of these other people did that. And he's got the only plan to reduce crime. It's an eight point plan. It's a plan that has worked in New York already and in about 20 other cities around the world. So I think people can feel that of all the candidates running, it's almost, they can almost feel guaranteed that he's gonna be able to reduce crime. And I think when crime becomes the issue, people forget whether they're Republicans or Democrats. That's how I got elected. And uh, that's how uh, Republicans do get elected. It's when they desperately need us. <laughs> right now, they desperately need us. And nobody can make the case better than Andrew on the issue of crime. The others hardly ever really talk about it. And when they talk about it, they just repeat the things that Andrew put out eight months ago. Okay. Let's, uh, let's take some more phone calls. Uh, let's go to Rifke in Brooklyn. Barbara, thank you for your call. Thank you for waiting. Your question for our guest. Go ahead, Rifke. I had to call in after that Stan's question. I mean, it's such a ridiculous question. You know why? He, he had, uh, uh, Giuliani, he has a fantastic role model and a fantastic person, he should live and be well, Rudy Giuliani, behind him to guide him. What more can, a, can we ask for? I don't like the uh, governor right now. I would never vote for her. But who else is there to vote for? I, I, I think um, uh, Andrew Giuliani is a fantastic choice. Well, well, I want to thank you very much, first and foremost. And, model and, and to stand behind him and guide him. So I, 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 I want to Andrew, Andrew wants to respond to you. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. Uh, Rudy. I just want to, I want to thank you very much. You know, look, you're absolutely right. And as a son, um, I'm blessed to have an incredible father, uh, somebody who I think is the greatest crime fighter in the history of New York City and one of the greatest crime fighters in the history of our country. Uh, so you're absolutely right. He's he's a resource that I've tapped into during this campaign. And as governor, absolutely, uh, we would be working together to make sure we make New York the safest large state in the country again. And that's why I'm asking for your vote this coming Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rifkin, for your phone call. Rudy, uh, have you been telling Andrew what to do, giving him advice along the campaign? <laughs> well, tell us I, the real story. I don't tell Andrew what to do. I never I never I never did. I don't have to. Andrew is a, a man on his own. From the day he graduated from college, he supported himself. He had his own. He had his own business. He went to work for President Trump. He's one of the few people that lasted four years with President Trump. 
Trump, for, uh, not not because of, of President Trump. It's very difficult to last four years in the White House. But Andrew's got incredible stamina, very, very intelligent. And I'll tell you the thing that he has that impressed uh, uh, General Flynn and why General Flynn endorsed him. He's got passion and courage. Now, remember, General Flynn was Zeldin's commanding officer. And he endorsed Andrew. Said Andrew has the leadership, Zeldin doesn't. I think that's very, very important. And the whole idea of age and experience, it's not about age and experience. It's about what you got inside. He, he's just about, Andrew's just about the age of Ted, Theodore Roosevelt when he became governor. He's a pretty damn good governor. He's uh, older than Thomas Jefferson when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. So age is not the issue. You can be, uh, 80 years old and be Joe Biden and not know how to you know, walk around the White House. So this is a question of what do you have inside? Andrew's got it. And I think he's proved it on the campaign trail. Are you disappointed that President Donald Trump has not endorsed Andrew in the race? I'm not, I just, I'm not, I'm not disappointed. I, I really think that Andrew is better off standing on his own. And I think he's very comfortable doing that. Andrew, what do you have to say? No, I, look, I, I spoke to him also a couple of days ago. He's been paying very close attention to this. Um, he loves the way this campaign is trending. He's been seeing the polling that has winning this race here coming in down the final stretch. And I, I think we're in a great place here, Zev. We're just trying to make sure we tell New Yorkers that are supporting us, get out there and vote this coming Tuesday, June 28th. It's so important. You have to do it. We have room for one more phone call. Let's go to Yankee in Brooklyn. Yankee in Brooklyn, thank you for waiting. Your question for our guests. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm more, this is here for the father, uh, you know, uh, Mayor, uh, ex-Mayor Trinolani. Um, I'm wondering, as a federal prosecutor, what your position was before, I'm wondering why can't, there be like federal sentencing for certain crimes, like gun crimes. Why is it left up to the states? And then everything is just the judicial system is just like broken here. It's, it's really broken. Is there any way that the federal? Well, it's because the it's be because the I don't like to respond to you. It, it's right. because the uh, Biden administration and the Attorney General are a bunch of hypocrites. They talk about uh, new gun control legislation and they don't prosecute the gun laws that are being vi vi violated in the United States and nor do the prosecutors in New York. The prosecutor in Brooklyn does not prosecute people for their first offense of having a gun illegally, but then he wants new gun control laws. And let, let's think of the most famous one of all, Hunter Biden, we all know has been a 30 year massive drug addict. Uh, he was in possession of a 38 revolver, according to the computer. It's proven, we have all the records and the secret service got him out of it. So that's a 10 year felony. The federal government didn't prosecute it because he's Biden's son. So we got a level of hypocrisy. I don't, I don't even know how Biden can talk about gun control when his son is one of the major violators of the gun control law. Rudy, is there anything in the tapes, in the video, in the laptop that has not been made public that is of interest? Yes. Can you tell us what it is? Most of it is so sensitive, it would be very hard to describe. It's in the area of, a, of obscenity, child abuse. Um, and there are a lot of details to the crimes in China that haven't been unraveled yet. We've gotten up to proof of $31 million going to Biden and his son, which his son says Biden got 50% of. But I think it's quite a bit more than 31 million. And I think uh, further analysis of the hard drive will show that the 3.5 million from Russia is considerably more than that. But the reality is, isn't it crazy that we have a president that took money from China and Russia? 
I mean, it's not, it's crazy. This this would be like Franklin Roosevelt taking money from Germany during the war. I mean, of course, I'm being ridiculous. He didn't do that, and he wouldn't do that. But Joe Biden has taken money from our biggest enemies. And then we wonder why he doesn't do anything with China, why he gives back an Air Force base 400 miles from China, which would be uh, like doing him a great big favor. Well, they've paid him at least $31 million, that's why. And the American people have been defrauded, and I'm not talking about election fraud now, I'm talking about the censorship of the hard drive, which they wouldn't allow to be published so the American people realized they were electing a 30-year crook. Andrew, if you get to be governor of New York, will you open up some hearings about Hunter Biden? Well, we'd, <laughs> we, we would have to see where the attorney general would actually do on this. Look, I, I'm focused on the issues that are really concerning New York. That's right. We've got to actually get crime down in New York. we we got to stop this out-migration flow. We've got to make sure from an economic standpoint that we're competitive with the Floridas of the world and the Californias of the world. We need to end these health mandates. And by the way, we need to create a tax credit system so that way if parents want to send their kids to yeshiva school, if they want to send their kids to parochial school, if they're Catholic or to homeschooling, they have those tax dollars in their hands. We're paying so much in taxes and property taxes. We should not have to actually tap more into that. We should be able to have that and have maximum choice in parental education there. And that's where I'm really focused on. Not some guy who uh, is, you know, making $500,000 a painting without any, uh, with any talent. Now, there's a few days left to primary day. Rudy, are you going to be campaigning with Andrew and Jewish neighbors such as Borough Park or any other upstate? Months? I'm, I'm going to be campaigning all over wherever he sends me. He's in charge of the campaign. He decides where I go. And so far, he's made some really good decisions. I spent the whole day today in Suffolk County, right in Zeldin's district, taking votes away from him. So we got a tremendous reception right in his congressional district. And then we moved on to, to, to uh, the other parts of Suffolk County. And uh, tomorrow, I'll be, I know I'll be in Staten Island for a while. I'm going to be in parts of Brooklyn, including the, the, the Jewish areas of Brooklyn. So wait, I'm, I'm going to be where he doesn't have time. Where he's, going to, he's going to go to one area. I'm going to go to another so we can get two for the price of one as much as possible. So which Jewish areas are you going to be? You're going to be in, in the Flatbush, Borough Park, Crown Heights, Williamsburg? Not, not, not sure yet. If you, if you keep up with my uh, uh, Twitter and the campaign, you'll know exactly where I'm going to be. So any closing thoughts, Rudy, that you want to share with our audience? Yeah, I mean, I think you could tell from his answer that the minute, uh, the minute you got off on Hunter Biden, I gave you all the reasons why uh, Biden's a crook, and Andrew stuck right with the issues. He is completely focused. He's got that kind of mind. And the reality is that they couldn't get anybody better right now with New York in such deep trouble He's going to turn the New York City government around top to bottom. No little changes, no little fooling around. It's going to be a different government in four years. He's going to do for New York State what I did for New York City, except he's going to do it better. <laughs> so, Andrew, so what have you learned from your father over these years in politics that you've taken to the campaign trail along with you? Oh, I mean, it's infinite wisdom. But more than anything, it's toughness. Right. I mean, we're talking about ever since Henry Hudson sailed down that river, now known as the Hudson River, there's been nobody in the history of the city of New York, the state of New York, that has saved more lives than Rudy Giuliani. They're big shoes to fill, but but I'm honored to be trying to step in in that path right there. Uh, but I would say it's it's toughness and it's focus and it's uh, it's if you set your mind to it. You can get it done, no matter whether they say it's the rotting apple back in 1991 with over 2,200 murders a year or New York State right now. When you have the right leadership with the right team, uh, you can turn around uh, a city or a state like New York. That's what we're going to do again, and that's why I'm asking New Yorkers for their vote this coming Tuesday, June 28th. It's a few hours left, so your father's going to be in Brooklyn. Are you going to be campaigning any other Jewish neighbors yourself between now and primary day on Tuesday? 
right now, right now, I can tell you that tomorrow I'm going to be in Bayside and then I'm going out to uh, Belmore and then heading to Jones Beach tomorrow specifically. Um, you know, we're I'm figuring out still Monday. I know we'll be doing Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse. Uh, I'll be on Greg Gutfeld's show on uh, Monday night. There should be a big rally in Staten Island. So we're still finalizing the exact neighborhoods right here. But, you know, we're at a point where there's less than 72 hours left and we're trying to hit as many of the media markets as possible now. Uh, so it's pretty a little less neighborhood based and a little bit more city based at this point. So we can try to hit as many ears as possible now, Zev. Now, listen, I, I thank you. And you've been a guest many times on the broadcast. I think you had you were on Rabbi Balkany's show. You were on my show two or three times. We look forward to having you back. Rudy, it's been a while since we had you on, so we appreciate you being joining us, and we hope you'll join us again. I sure will, Zeb. I miss you. <laughs> I miss it too. I remember the years when when you were there with with David Dinkins. <laughs> yeah, I remember too. We got a long history. I'll, I'll be happy to come back. Well, I'll just share one thing about our audience. We had an interview with you from an Italian kosher restaurant. I think it was Medici <laughs> Six. Remember that? <laughs> I remember it very, very well. Absolutely. So remember, you were ordering everything but the pasta. I said, Rudy, you're an Italian kosher restaurant. You're not ordering the pasta? He said, okay, I'll order the pasta. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I like the artichokes. Right. They, they were very I like good the, Roman, the Roman, the Jewish Roman artichokes that come from Trastevere, which, which, which is a Jewish neighborhood in, in, in Rome. And it's probably one of my favorite dishes. And they make it in the non-kosher restaurants as well as the kosher restaurants, but it's not as good. <laughs> I have to ask you the question. I asked, I asked the end of this question. I asked every elected official. That here is the toughest question of the interview tonight, Rudy. Are you ready? When you're on the campaign trail, what's your favorite Jewish food, kosher food? Oh, what's my favorite? I, I mean, I used, I used to love knishes. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I get, I'm getting a little too fat for those, uh, for those now. But I... Uh, I love, I love, I love, I'm, I'm going to sound embarrassed when I say this. I love the, the Hebrew hot dogs. Oh, the Hebrew national hot dogs. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah. I just, I just love them. I can eat 50 of them. <laughs> anyway, thank you for joining us. We look forward to having you back again. Andrew, success in all your endeavors. And we hope that you're going to join us again very soon too. Thank you, Zev. Appreciate it. Come on out this Tuesday, June 28th. Vote. Everybody, go out and vote. <laughs> Democrat, Republican, make sure you vote. It's the most important thing we can do. Thank you for being part of our show. Thank, Thank you, Jeff. Great to talk Thank to you again. Likewise. Nice speaking with you.